Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our students online as well. All right, let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our session. Anyone like to pray? Go ahead, Nikhil. Father, we thank you for this day, for this time, Lord. Once again, we come to your presence, Lord. And as we're going to start our classes, Father, teach us through also, Lord Jesus. Give us understanding. We can learn your word, Father. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, so last class we completed chapter 5. We looked at uh, uh, different ways on which we can, you know, have competitive advantage and strategy as an organization. Right now, we'll get into chapter 6. And chapter 6 is very interesting because we're going to talk about organizational structure and design. Now, let me just present the notes so we can just... When you look at God himself, God is a God of, God of structure and design. Right? Everything that he did was not randomly. Right? He had a structure, he had a design in place. And with structure and design comes success. Right? You, you, if you look at an organization, any organization with no structure or no design is a recipe for disaster. Why? Because nothing is going to happen there. Right? And when you and I are in an organization or leading an organization, we must ensure there is structure and design. Look at, you know, look at where we are. I mean, even if we are in Bible college, we have structure and design, right? There's a structure. It's not like you can come at 11 o'clock and say, hey, uh, can I attend the first hour class? It doesn't work that way, right? There's, there's, a, there's a structure set in place. And the reason a structure is set in place is so that things go in an orderly manner, right? So in this lesson, we're going to look unpack a few uh, biblical ideas and biblical plans and strategies that we can apply in an organization to bring in structure and design, right? So when you talk about structure and design, the first thing that comes to our mind is management, right? So you, you, if you've got an organization, uh, why do you want structure and design? Just Is it because everyone have it? Or is it because we want to see the organization grow and become fruitful, right? Uh, the reason we have it is because we can manage the operations in an organization. Like, like some of you may you know, be ready to start a church. Right now, when your church is 20, 30 people, it's all right. But as the church grows, you must have people to manage. You must have people, you have, must have a structure in place, right? And then you need a management structure. And then you need to build on the operations of the ministry, right? Bigger the ministry, bigger is all of these needed. More the management, more the structure. Um, and the same applies to an organization, right? In, in case you are working in a corporate sector, you're planning to start a small business, all of this is important. So let's look at what we can learn from chapter six, right? Organizational structure and design must enable the organization to respond quickly. Uh, here, I'm here, right? Must enable the organization to respond quickly to the changing market conditions. Now, here there are structures, systems, and processes within the organization that eliminate bottlenecks. And, and you know, we, we can't always predict what's going to happen in an organization. So that's where, you know, uh, design comes into place. That's where we plan ahead uh, for the things, right, that, that, that we are doing. So let's look at a few points. And then we'll we'll try and relate all of this even to ministry, right? So even as we go through this entire course, don't don't look at okay, you know, I'm not going to start my own business. So why am I learning all this? No. Even if you join a church or you're starting a church, you will need to apply these in the organization. Right. So there's the ministry side. There's an organizational side. Right. So if you look at our 
APC. We have the ministry side. What is the ministry side? Pastoral team, sermon notes, Bible college is a ministry side. Then you have the organizational side. Media team, IT team, graphics team, lecturers, the Bible college, the entire administration, management, right? All of this is required. So if you look at uh, APC, so we have senior pastor, then we have associate pastors, then we have team leaders, team leaders to volunteer leaders, volunteer leaders to volunteers. So there's a hierarchy, right? And uh, that's why, you know, that enables us to work efficiently as an organization. But then you also got the ministry side. Right? So the ministry side, you have the pastoral team and those who are teaching, uh, they have to prepare themselves right, in the ministry. So if organizationally, if things don't do, go well, or it's not structured, it will affect the ministry side. You get what I'm saying, right? If imagine the IT team are not doing, I mean, if it doesn't work out well, if the videos don't come out well, and we're not able to post it online, I can teach, but the IT team is required to make this available. So you see that both go together, right? Uh, so number one, structure, order, and design are godly virtues. First Corinthians 14, 33, and 40. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Let all things be done decently and in order. And so God is a God of structure and design. And not only when we look at an organization, but when we look at ourselves, our personal lives, we must have a structure and design in place for the way that we do things, right? So for example, now all of you are Bible college students, you must have a structure. You must have a way of, uh, okay, this is what I am going to do in this week, right? Or this is the timetable that I have that I will follow. Yes, right? Why is it important? Because that is what will bring structure and order into your life. If I don't have structure and order, I am not going to be fruitful. Right? I, I, I'm going to be end up doing one hour here, one hour there. It's all going to be a mess, right? So as, as our own lives as well, Bring in structure, right? Bring in an order in your life so that when you are, uh, you know, whether it's ministry, whether it's uh, leading an organization, you know how to lead it well. Yes, right? Now, this structure changes over time, right? So, for example, you know, when I was not married, I had a certain structure in my life. Okay, these. Get up for prayer. These are the things I'll do. This many hours reading the word. This many hours of, um, you know, uh, just praying and uh, uh, getting into studying the word. So I had a whole structure in place. Right now, after getting married and, and you have children, the, that structure changes. I can't say I can't do the same thing, right? But you work out on what uh, what is convenient for you, right? When we see in all creation, God is a God of uh, God who, of of creation, of design and structure. God established it. He maintained order. He when, when we maintain structure and order, there is peace, harmony, and the purpose of the institution is accomplished. When God created the heavens, He created it in order. Yes, six days, and there was there was so much of order in what He did. And the seventh day, he chose to rest, right? Uh, it did not happen randomly, but when God created, he did it intentionally. And that is why when you and I are working in an organization, we intentionally build a structure, have a structure in place, right? So sometimes, so what happens here, just giving this example, right? So after the break, after Bible college gets over, you know, we the topics are sent to us right the the courses which are which we are going to teach and so what we do is we're going to first okay make sure okay what are the days that i'm there right so i align my other work structure it out right 
So these are the days I'm here, and this is what I must do on the other days. And um, you know, uh, these are the hours that I need to prepare for the topic. And everything is done before time. It's not like last minute, OK, where's my book? Prepare now. Right? So structure, order, and design helps fulfill a purpose. Right? And when you and I have a purpose, we must have structure and order. Right? Now, where there is no purpose, there is no structure and order. Have you seen, I always say this, right? Uh, you've seen people just randomly going through things in life. There's no, there's no purpose, right? And that's not what we are called for. God has a purpose for us. So we, what we are doing is we are giving God the glory when we put in a structure in our life. Yes? OK, let's look at number two. Align organizational structure to strategy. Right, Numbers 1 and 52, the rest of the Israelites shall set up camp company by company and each man with his own group and under his own banner. Now look at this. The people of Israel have come out of Egypt and by the time it's, you know, they've come to this place, the people of Israel are very upset. Right, because they want, actually in Numbers, if you, if you read it, they say, let us go back. Let's find a leader. Forget about Moses and Joshua and all that. We'll find a leader and we'll go back to Egypt. They've come to that situation. right? Because Moses was unable to handle these people. And God gives Moses this idea. He says, bring in structure in the camp. So what do you do? They, they You're supposed to... You know, for example, I'm just giving this example, right? So there are 12 tribes of Israel. So all the 12, first divide them into tribes. So you know who's doing what or which tribe is camped where, right? Look at Numbers 10, 13, and 14. Anyone like to read that? Numbers 10, 13, and 14. They begin to march at the command of the Lord through Moses. And each time they moved, they were in the same order. Those under the band of the division led by the tribe of Judah start out, start out first, company by company, with Nahashon, son of Aminadab, is in command. Okay. Now let's look at the structure. Right? We have it there. God gave Moses this instruction. Number one, you lead about 600,000 people in an orderly manner in the in their journey to the promised land okay so how many people are there 600,000 6 lakh people right now each of the 12 tribes had one leader so there are 12 tribes each tribe had one leader who directly reported to Moses so now it's changed remember Moses was trying to you know handle all the small problems that was going on so now God is saying no you don't do that have the 12 tribes, have one leader, that one leader will report to you. Whatever the whole problem in that tribe, this person will report to you, right? Then, when they camped, three tribes camped on the four sides of the tabernacle. So you got 12, you got three tribes, you got the tabernacle right in the middle, right? And you got four sides, it's a square. So three, 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 and three. Now, who's giving these instructions? God. Did God say, okay, as long as you get into the promised land, that's what I promised Abraham. I told Abraham, you'll get into the promised land. How you do it is yours. No. So God said, one leader, each tribe. You've got the tabernacle, four corners, three tribes in each corner. Right? Then he goes on. Which tribe... Sorry, when, when they camped, three tribes camped on each of the four sides. Which tribe on which side of the tabernacle and in which order was clearly given? So when they moved, there was proper order, tribe by tribe, in how they moved. Right? They also had different kinds of trumpet sounds, different uh, one kind of trumpet blast to gather the leaders, 
another kind of trumpet blast to gather the entire community and a, another kind of blast to start the movement of camp. This organizational structure was a clear strategy on how they could effectively enter the promised land. You see, you, you see the wisdom there? You've got 12 leaders, three tribes on each side, and God is telling, and the people there are saying, there are three different, there are different kinds of trumpets. One trumpet was to gather the leaders. Another trumpet was to gather the entire community. So for example, Moses wanted to speak to the tribe of Benjamin. So there was a certain trumpet. Right, so that leader will come. Or he wanted to speak to the whole community. The entire tribe wanted, so there's a trumpet, and the entire tribe would come. So now Moses is not thinking, okay, how do I reach out to these people? He's not going and searching for the leader. Where is the leader? No, there's a trumpet. Right? And then there was a trumpet sound also for if, if, if we had to move, right? Now they're on the go, right? They have to get into the promised land. So there was a trumpet sound. Okay, that means everyone get ready. We have to move, right? And so if you read numbers, there are also trumpet sounds for battle, right? Uh, there were trumpet sounds for uh, uh, when people had to uh, come to the Ark of the Covenant or to the tabernacle. There were different trumpet sounds. Now, why was all this in place? To bring in structure and design. And this way, it was more effective. So if you look at when God, you know, when Moses came out from Egypt to, like you see, Exodus from the Exodus to the time numbers, you know, uh, 10, there's a, there's a vast difference. Initially, they just came out. There was no structure, there was nothing. But over time, God brought in the structure. God used Moses. God used uh, Moses' father-in-law to give him ideas, right? God used Joshua and, and Caleb to bring in strategies. And eventually, they were able to enter the promised land, right? Organizational structure and, de and design determines where people are positioned, a chain of command, systems, processes in place. Right? Let me let me share this with you. This is what we do in APC. For example, we have a conference coming up. Any conference. Right? Let's take the example of men's conference. Right? We have a men's conference coming up in. I think it's June 18th, right? Uh, June 18th. Men's conference. Now, it is not like, you know, okay, we have men's conference announcement comes up on the Sunday sermon registration link. No. You know, we work six months ahead. So now, six months ahead, the banner, the speaker, everything is already decided, right? Then the in, in three in the third month, so for example, this is June, right? So March 18th, our first announcement goes on the Sunday video announcements. This is men's conference, this is the date, this is the speaker, this is the theme, this is the uh, registration link. Please go ahead and register. The moment that is done, the next day is a Monday. We send a save the date emailer. So an email has gone to all the men, 18 years and above, to save the date, right? Then, that is in March. Then in April, second announcements run, right? A Sunday announcement. Then we send a first WhatsApp reminder. And then parallelly, we send a second emailer with the link, right? And what is the third one? So you got, uh, so there's March, April, now you got May. May, you have your third Sunday video announcements. Right? After third announcement, you have your emailer once again with the registration link. And maybe one week before the event, a WhatsApp message is sent with final reminder. Please register. Now, all of this takes place. You know, I was just preparing the email to send it out, right? 
Now, all of this takes place not alone. So one, if I send it now, then you've got the graphics team who has to prepare the graphics. And you've got the IT team who've got to put that in the website, church website. Then you've got the social uh, digital marketing. So you've got Facebook, Instagram, our digital uh, you know, uh, platforms we posted there. And then you've got ID team. You know, I've got a team of people who will look at registrations. We've done all of this. What if there are less registrations? So we, we, we have coordinators who will call people. Right? Say, so this is the thing. We call our life group leaders. We call. So everything is happening together. And that's when a conference can be successful. It, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not like the link goes out, everyone register, and everyone are happy. It doesn't work that way. For because remember, we are it's a it's a you know everyone are working. It's one Saturday. Everyone wants to you know rest on the Saturday, but we need to make it in a way that they are excited to come for the conference, right? We need to help them to understand that okay, you are gonna benefit from it. Right? So all of these things has to be done. Right? And if this is not done, then we may not see fruit. And that's where organizational structure, you bring in strategy to the organization. Even already, we, we started working on CLC 2025. We've got the team. We've got the team. We've got the speakers. Everything is ready. The venue is not booked because we are looking to have a bigger uh, you know, venue. But everything is ready. The speakers, the timetable, the agenda, the, the food, the save the date, email us. Everything is ready. For what? Jan 2025. I've got topics ready for uh, men's conference 2025. There are topics ready for life group leaders trainings for uh, 2025, 2026. It's all ready, right? but it's ready on paper. But I need people, organizational structure to get that done. Yes, right? And, and so that's why uh, to, to be successful, we need to do all of this, right? Then you got organizational design affects the strategic capability and sustainability. What is the meaning of sustainability? The word sustainability. Sorry? Yes, last thing. You can start something and it can just fizzle out and die out very quickly. But if you want to sustain something, you need structure. Right? Let's read this uh, portion from uh, First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 4 and verse 37. Anyone would like to read? And then David assigned sons of the Levites to the chest of God to lead worship to intercede, give thanks, and praise the God of Israel. David le left Asap as his co-worker with the chest of the covenant of God and in charge of the work of worship. They were responsible for the needs of worship around the clock. Look at this. David has become the king of Israel. After becoming the king, the first thing he did is what? He brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. And what did he do? He didn't say, okay, the covenant has come here, now let it be here, it's ours. So it's sitting in the you know in the temple. No. He desired for non-stop worship to happen in the tent. So what did David do? He organized 4,000 people to attend the tabernacle. 4,000 people. 4,000 musicians, 288 prophetic singers to serve in the tabernacle. Okay, they were again divided into 24 smaller units, groups of teams of musicians and singers. Basically, what did David do? He made rosters, right? You got 4,000 people. Now, in this 4,000 people, many of them are uh, singers, musicians, everything. But separately, he had 288 prophetic singers. So then he made worship rosters. First four hours in the morning, you go. Next four hours, next four hours. And this happened 24 by 7. Is it easy to sustain? It's tiring. 
but he knew how to do it. Now, being the king, what what is David's, uh, uh, you know, what is he? What's his skills? Looking after sheep? Playing the harp. <laughs> yeah. Did he learn about organizational structure? No, but God gave him the wisdom. God gave him the wisdom. See what he did. These leaders were appointed to maintain order in everything. So he didn't say, you go and do it. But he had leaders. Okay, you make sure it's done. All the musicians and singers were highly skilled. So there was excellence in all that was done. Now, this is something that we want to do. right? So why do we have... You know how uh, I think Roshan would be better to explain this, but I'll just share it. You audition for the worship team. If you want to audition for an instrument in APCA, the worship team, first thing you have a pre auditioning meeting. You meet with them, meet with the leaders. So you meet with everyone, and then they tell you what, what you have to do. Then you audition. The songs are given to you. Then you audition. If you play it wrong, you're not selected. It's very simple. right? An email is sent that you're not selected. Please try another time. It's very simple. There's no, OK, God loves you and all. God loves you. God will always continue to love you. OK? That's there. Skill. If you're not selected, you're not selected. Very simple. Go back, learn, get, do it well. Learn the song, play it well, you'll get selected. So if you're selected, then you have three months where the, the so for example, I've, I'm selected with electric guitar. So I'll have to go for the practice sessions. So for example, there's a practice session every Saturdays or Fridays, whenever the worship is. So I'll have to go as an electric guitarist. I have to sit and watch for three months. You, you can't talk, you can't talk, you can't say, I want to play. No, three months. You have to sit and be there. Right? Three months. It was initially six months. We made it three months. Uh, three months, you have to just be there. Now, if you miss those practice sessions, that three months will become four months. Uh, four months will become five months. Now, why are we doing this? Because we understand that when you're doing it, we want to see sustainability. Right? You want to see people who know what is the vision and why we are doing this. Right? It's not you're not here only for your skill. We also want to see commitment. We also want to see uh, you know uh, humility. And that's what David did here. He the worship at the tabernacle went on for 24/7 for how many years? 33 years. That is called sustainability. Right? 4,000 people, 288 prophetic singers, 24 teams, one leader in each team. Rosters were made throughout 24-7 worship for 33 years. So when you and I start something or we're working in an organization, always look at sustainability. Is this process that I'm doing going to sustain the ministry? Or is this process that I'm following going to sustain the work that I'm doing? If it's not going to sustain, change it. Try different things, right? Uh, you know, when we had, when we started off as life group with life groups, um, we were about ten life groups in 20, 2015, or we were about ten or eleven life groups. And now I had to think about ideas on how to get people to start life groups. Right? How do I get them interested? How do I get them to know that life groups are important? We need life groups, right? So we have to come up with ideas, strategies, and uh, what are the ways I can sustain this life group ministry? And you know, over time, I made mistakes, but I learned, and we got a structure in place. And now the life group ministry is just growing, right? We have more than a, we have about forty-one life groups right now, strong life groups reaching out all across Bangalore, right? And we're only going to grow. And sustainability. When I look at 2026, 2027, what is this ministry going to look like? Right? And you bring in those plans and strategies, right? Next one, very important. Have the right teams in place. Let's read. 
first chronicles that entire portion there have the right interpretation first chronicles uh, chapter 12 verse 17 18 21 to 22 david went to meet them and said if you are coming as friends to help me you're welcome here join us but if you intend to be- betray me to my enemies even though i have not tried to hurt you the god of our ancestors will know it and punish you god's spirit took control of one of them amasai who later became the commander of the 30 and he called out david son of jesse we are yours success to you and those who help you god is on your side david welcomed them and made them officers in his army they served david as officers over his troops because they were all outstanding soldiers later they were officers in the israelite army almost every day new men joined david forces so that his army was soon enormous very interesting guys david is not yet the king first chronicles 12 but the people some of the people came and said david we we will we are with you right whatever you tell us to do we'll do we are in your army now david had nothing with him right he was hiding right he was not like he was king but these people came and said we are with you we are yours whatever you tell us to do we'll do it was like god sent the people to david but what did david do he used wisdom right he didn't say okay just sit around let's let's uh, you know plan out how, you know once i become king what we'll do no look at what he did david one of the things we see david do is he brought the right teams in place and he built capacity and organized them into strong units right so what did he do he built the right teams was he king not yet was he going out to fight not yet but in his mind he had already planned okay i need if i'm going to be the king i need to build right team so it was more like a practice what he was doing here what did he do he organized them into strong units and as 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 david built his army he assembled outstanding soldiers to lead his troops so david had a special 37 warriors to oversee his army so i think there were about Uh, the number is not given here but i think there were about 4000 people who 4000 oh. oh, we can just i'll just double check that right so there were probably about hundreds of people easily right uh, who came to david and now he's got 37 special warriors who oversaw the entire army so you got david the leader 37 warriors they looked after the entire army so he built a team of 37 people who will report to him right and then out of these 37 there were the famous 30 right so look at the hierarchy david 37 then he had a 30 and out of this 30 was the famous 3 who were the most valiant soldiers so that means wherever david went those three were there or whatever decision david made he checked with those three those three were the closest and you see that hierarchy he built teams 37 then he had a 30 then he had a three and he was then he was overseeing all of them so bigger the problem he would go to those three say okay what do we do the problem is not very big he would probably go to the 30 of it's not when that he'll tell the 30 people hey just talk to the 37 of them get it resolved and keep the work going on you see how he brought right teams in place very 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 important the you if you are starting a ministry have the right people and the right teams in place start off with the right teams these are the teams i'm going to have and then you get people to fill in those teams right the right teams in right places the the team with people who are really good at what they do and know how to work well together will eventually succeed any okay for example you look at um on sunday morning right 
uh, on uh, Christmas, was it Christmas or New Year. I was in awe of the production. It was, it was such a everything was so well produced, right? Everything, right? It was like a production, beautiful worship. Went into the, of course, it happens every time, but but the way it was just done, it was so wonderful, and it was all teamwork. I mean, we go up with the mic and hold the mic, but everything should be. It was just so much of, uh, you know, teams working together to get this done. Right, getting the right people and putting the right teams in place is an easy. Is not an easy task. It takes time. Right. Uh, if if you look at uh, ministry, you will have people uh, who will come. People may leave. Right? And it's part of life, right? You, you know, we may have people who we feel that, okay, they'll be there with us, but they may leave and go. It's okay, right? Get the right people. Move on. We cannot stop what God is doing, right? Get the right teams, uh, and, and it takes time, but there can be ups and downs in this journey. But eventually, you'll have the right teams in the right place, carrying out the right work. And that is your recipe for success. The right teams, the right people, the right structure. You will succeed. There's no way you'll not succeed. Now, again, success is measured in different ways. Right? You can have a conference with 100 people, and the conference can be very successful because you minister to all 100 of them. All 100 people are blessed. They go back and they 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 want to do something. Like, okay, you can have a, a conference at 500, yet it may not have been very effective. Right? So you look at success not only on numbers, but how you've been able to impact people, how you're able to build teams and speak into people's lives. Right? Sometimes your best teams begins with the most unlikely. Let's read that. First Samuel 21, 1 and 2. First Samuel 22, verse 1 and 2. David fled from the city of Gath and went to a cave near the town of Adullam. When his brothers and the rest of his family heard that he was there, they joined him. People who were oppressed or in debt or dissatisfied went to him, about 400 men in all, and he became their leader. But it's 400 men, right? So 400 men came to him and said, We are under you, right? We want to be under your leadership. And did David think about it? Right? Look at verse 1. It says, David fled from the city of Gath and went to a cave. He's a fugitive, he's running away. But the this 400 people came and said, We want to be under your leadership. Can you picture what David would have been feeling? Why? Why do you want to see if what if I die? What if Saul catches me and kills me? All these thoughts may have come to his mind, but remember that our best team sometimes begins with those who we think uh, are not the right people. Right? Sometimes we may think, okay, this person may not do it. Uh, let me give you this example. Uh, in Mangalore, right? Uh, we uh, when we started off, we were about ten people in the church, and so one Sunday, this young man came in. He's a college student. He came in late, and he was very casual. So he was new to church, and uh, he was very casual. Just after church, I said hi. We were only about ten, twelve of us. So I said hi, thank you for coming. Uh, then he was saying, you know what, I'm from Odisha, and uh, my father is a pastor. And all of it. Uh, he said, see, but I'm very busy. I may not come to church. I said, yeah, that's fine. So he didn't come the next Sunday. And then uh, the Sunday after that, he came to church. Uh, he came on time and he was sitting. He So after that, every Sunday he was coming. Right? And so eventually he told me, what can I do in the church? I know that we are very small. What can I do? I said, okay, can you do the PPT? Because I need somebody to come early, set up the PPT, the song lyrics. He said, yeah, I can do that. 
Now, initially, when I looked at him, I felt he's not uh, somebody who can, you know, uh, be here. He was very casual, right? He was not very interested. And you can make out, right, when a person is interested in church. and But surprisingly, he would be the first one to come to church because he had the laptop with him, right? So he would come. He would open the church. He would shut up the laptop, everything. Every Sunday he was there. Then what he said was, you know, Pastor, there's a lot of uh, dust here. Uh, can I clean the place? And he did that also. And then he would say, Pastor, can we go out on outreach? I, I know some places. And he would come with me. Eventually, he was like the one person who was there for everything for me. Right? If I needed any help in anything, he was there. Wednesday prayers in the evening, he was there. He will open the place, you know, put the room fresh and everything, set the chairs, keep it ready. But in my mind, I felt that this guy, you know, but he became a very strong asset to the church. He did everything. You know, if anything needed repairs, he would go. Uh, you know, we had a stage brought uh, from another place. He made sure that, you know, he got the measurements, he got the carpet done. He did everything. What am I trying to say? Sometimes we look at people and think he or she may not be the right person. Unless we give them an opportunity, we may not know it. Right? David, 400 people came to him and said, we will follow you. David didn't say, okay, you know, you'll go back. My life only, I'm only going through problem. How will I look after you 400? No. He said, okay, this is a good opportunity. One day I'm going to be king. Right? So let's start with what God has given me. And he was able to build teams there. Believe in your team and see beyond their current struggles. Right? Mark 16, 9 through 15. Let's read that. Now, when she rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him, as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he revealed their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel of to every creature. Very, very important point. I think in, in ministry this is something that we all must learn. Look at Jesus. He had 12, 11 people now because uh, Judas had uh, you know, committed suicide. Uh, 11 of them, closest to Jesus, spent three and a half years with Jesus. Jesus also told them that he's going to die, but he will resurrect again. Now the crucifixion has happened. Jesus has death. They buried him. And all 11 of them did not believe that Jesus you know, came back, is resurrected. All 11 of them did not believe. Why? Because they know that Jesus was crucified. Now what's happening? They're thinking naturally. No, no, he, we saw him crucified. So the initial reports that came in, hey, you know what, the tomb is empty. They did not believe initially. It took them some time. Now these were the men who were closest to Jesus. Jesus didn't, uh, you know, Jesus was, they probably saw Jesus from the morning to night. And they stayed with Jesus. But they were in a season of unbelief. And here's what Jesus did. He called those same 11 people who did not believe. He corrected them. He rebuked them for their disbelief. And he exhorted them. And he gave the same 11 people the commission. And said what? Go and make disciples. Now, is he giving them an important task? Or is it a simple task? Now, if they don't go and share the gospel, all that Jesus did will end over there only. So it was a very important task, very important mandate. 
Jesus trusted them, even though they didn't believe in Jesus. You see that? So as leaders, we must find this ability to believe in, our, in your people, believe in your team, right? He went past, Jesus went past their current struggles. He knew that once that moment of disbelief goes, they will do anything for God. Right? That he had been that they were equipped and empowered, that they will give their lives for the vision that he's placing before them. It was just that season. I can always picture Peter. Why was he not at the cross? Can you ever think? At least okay, others okay. Why was Peter not there at the cross? Peter, James, and John. John was there. What about Peter and James? Why were they not there? The closest to Jesus. Right? As far as we know, Jesus took Peter, James, and John everywhere. Peter was not there. Right? Uh, but you just picture that. Right? But but Jesus is saying it's just a season for him. But I know what Peter will do. Once this season of disbelief goes, I know what Peter can do. And so Peter, Jesus believed in Peter. You and I must believe in our team because we've invested in them. Right? We believe in so for example, you go back and you're ministering to people, it's been five years. Uh, believe in the people that you have ministered to because you've invested in their lives. Now they may be there with you, they may go out elsewhere and do something on their own, but believe that they will be fruitful for the kingdom of God. Right? Uh, don't quit on them, see beyond their current struggles. And I would say this has happened to me many, many, many times. Right. Uh, the first time I was asked to preach in one of the locations, I preached. I don't know what I preached. I was so nervous. Uh, and, you know, uh, all of them were there. And it was quite embarrassing because uh, more than anything, I was looking whether, you know, I'm saying the right thing or what. Uh, and I thought I'll never get an opportunity again. Right. But I knew, but uh, thank God for godly leaders I, the opportunity was given but i made sure that the second time i don't repeat the same mistakes right so believe in your team and i remember i was talking to this life group leader and he was uh, and i went to this life group and this life group leader was going on talking right and uh, after the whole meeting i said hey life group is not for you to talk it's for others to talk it's a discussion right uh, i was quite upset but I knew that he's a good leader and he can do really well. So I told him, see, it's not for you to talk. Others should talk. Is, nobody wants to know about your testimony and all of that in the life group. Uh, but then change, right? And he started, the life group just grew bigger. And then, uh, you know, we had to, you know, split the group into two because it was very big. Right? And people were so blessed, great leadership. Right? So we be, see beyond their struggles right? and help them to grow. Okay, we'll take a break, we'll come back, uh, and then we'll continue from where we stopped. Okay.